Hello everybody. We are back at the Caribou Public Library. We're going to continue reading Peter Pan for our chapter book story time. Um, and I am Miss Erin, so I thank you for joining us today. We're on to chapter seven in Peter Pan. And at the end of chapter six was when they had just finished the little house for Wendy and they all went inside. Um, and so chapter seven is called The Home Under the Ground. One of the first things that Peter did next day was to measure Wendy and John and Michael for hollow trees. Hook, you remember, had sneered at the boys for thinking they needed a tree apiece. But this was ignorance, for unless your tree fitted you, it was difficult to go up and down. And no two of the boys were quite the same size. Once you fitted, you drew in your breath at the top and down you went at exactly the right speed. While to ascend, you drew in and let out alternately and so wriggled up. Of course, when you have mastered the action, you are able to do these things without thinking of them, and then nothing can be more graceful. Hmm. But you simply must fit, and Peter measures you for your tree as carefully as for a suit of clothes, the only difference being that the clothes are made to fit you, while you have to be made to fit the tree. Usually it is done quite easily, as by your wearing too many garments or too few, but if you are bumpy in awkward places, or the only available tree is an odd shape, Peter does some things to you, and after that, you fit. Once you fit, great care must be taken to go on fitting. And this, as Wendy was to discover to her delight, keeps a whole family in perfect condition. Wendy and Michael fitted their trees at the first try, but John had to be altered a little. At a few days practice, after a few days practice, they could go up and down as gaily as buckets in a well. And how ardently they grew to love their home under the ground, especially Wendy. It consisted of one large room, as all houses should do, with a floor in which you could dig if you wanted to go fishing. And in this floor grew stout mushrooms of a charming color, which were used as stools. A never tree tried hard to grow in the center of the room, but every morning they sawed the trunk through, level with the floor. By tea time, it was always about two feet high, and they put a door on top of it, and the whole thus became a table. <laughs> as soon as they cleared away, they sawed off the trunk again, and thus there was more room to play. There was an enormous fireplace, which was in almost any part of the room where you cared to light it. And across this, Wendy stretched strings made of fiber from which she suspended her washing. The bed was tilted against the wall by day and let down at 6.30, when it filled nearly half of the room. And all of the boys slept in it, except Michael, lying like sardines in a tin. There was a strict rule against turning round until one gave the signal when all turned at once. <laughs> Michael should have used it also, but Wendy would have a baby. And since he was the littlest, and you know what women are, and the short and the long of it is that he was hung up in a basket. It was round and simple and not unlike what baby bears would have made of an underground house in the same circumstances. But there was one recess in the wall, no larger than a birdcage, which was the private apartment of Tinkerbell. It could be shut off from the rest of the home by a tiny curtain, which Tink, who was most fastidious, always kept drawn when dressing or undressing. No woman, however large, could have had a more exquisite boudoir and bedroom chamber combined. The couch, as she called it, was a genuine queen mab, mab with club legs, and she varied the bedspreads according to what fruit blossom was in season. Her mirror was a Puss in Boots, of which there are now only three unshipped known to the fairy dealers. <laughs> the washstand was pie crust and reversible. The chest of drawers, an authentic Charming the Sixth, and the carpet and rugs of the best, the early period, of Marjorie and Robin. There was a chandelier from Tiddlywinks for the look of the thing, but of course she lit the residence herself. Tink was very contemptuous of the rest of the house, as indeed was perhaps inevitable, and her chamber, though beautiful, looked rather conceited, having the appearance of a nose permanently turned up. Here's a picture of Tinkerbell behind her curtain. <laughs> I suppose it was all especially entrancing to Wendy, because those rampageous boys of hers gave her so much to do. Really, there were whole weeks when, except perhaps with the stocking in the evening, she was never above ground. The cooking, I can tell you, kept her nose to the pot, and even if there was nothing in it, even though there was no pot, she had to keep watching it, <laughs> watching that it came a boil just the same. 
you never exactly knew whether they would be a real meal or just a make-believe one. It all depended on Peter's whim. He could eat, really eat, if it was part of a game, but he could not stodge just to feel stodgy, which is what most children like better than anything else. The next best thing being to talk about it. Make-believe was so real to him that during a meal of it, you could see him getting rounder. Of course, it was trying, but you simply had to follow his lead. And if you could prove to him that you were getting loose for your tree, he would, oh, he let you stodge. <laughs> Wendy's favorite time for sewing and darning was after they had all gone to bed. Then, as she expressed it, she had a breathing time for herself. And she occupied it in making new things for them and putting double pieces on the knees, for they were almost frightfully hard on the knees. When she sat down to a basket full of their stockings, every heel with a hole in it, she would fling up her arms and exclaim, Oh dear, I am sure I sometimes think spinsters are to be envied. To not have children, right? Her face beamed when she exclaimed this. You remember about her pet wolf. Well, it was very soon discovered that she had come to the island and found her out. And they just ran into each other's arms. And after that, it followed her about everywhere. As time wore on, did she think much about, much about the beloved parents that she had left behind her? This is a difficult question because it is quite impossible to say how time does wear on in the Neverland, where it is calculated by moons and suns and there are ever so many more of them on the mainland. But I am afraid that Wendy did not really worry about her father and mother. She was absolutely confident that they would always keep the window open for her to fly back and this gave her complete ease of mind. What did disturb her at times was that John remembered his parents vaguely only, as people he had once known, while Michael was quite willing to believe that she was really his mother. These things scared her a little and nobly anxious to do her duty. She tried to fix the old life in the mines by setting them examination papers on it, as like as possible to the ones that she used to do at school. The other boys thought this awfully interesting and insisted on joining and they made slates for themselves and sat around the table writing and thinking hard about the questions that she had written on another slate and passed around. They were the most ordinary questions. What was the color of mother's eyes? Which was taller, father or mother? Was mother blonde or brunette? Answer all three questions if possible. A. Write an essay of not less than 40 words on how I spent my last holidays or the caretakers of father and mother, oh, the characters of father and mother compared. Only one of these to be attempted. Or describe mother's laugh, describe father's laugh, describe mother's party dress, describe the kennel and its inmate. <laughs> they were just everyday questions like these, and when you could not answer them, you were told to make a cross, and it was really dreadful what a number of crosses even John made. Of course, the only boy who replied to every question was slightly, and no one could have been more hopeful of coming out first, but his answers were perfectly ridiculous, and he really came out last. A melancholy thing. Peter did not compete. For one thing, he despised all mothers except for Wendy. And for another, he was the only boy on the island who could either who could neither write and nor spell, not the smallest word. He was above all that sort of thing. <laughs> By the way, the questions were all written in the past tense. What was the color of mother's eyes? And so on. Wendy, you see, had been forgetting too. Instead of saying, what are the color of mother's eyes, right? Adventures, of course, as we shall see, were of daily occurrence. But about this time, Peter invented, with Wendy's help, a new game that fascinated him enormously until he suddenly had no more interest in it, which, as you have been told, was what happened with all his games. It consisted in pretending not to have adventures, in doing the sort of thing that John and Michael had been doing all their lives, sitting on stools, flinging balls in the air, pushing each other, going out for walks, and coming back without having killed so much as a grizzly. <laughs> ah, there's a picture of Wendy doing her needlework. And we have the basket that Michael slept in. Peter watching her. <clears throat> to see Peter doing nothing on a stool was a great sight. He could not help looking solemn at such times. To sit still seemed to him such a comic thing to do. He boasted that he had gone for a walk for the good of his health. 
For several sons, these were the most novel of all adventures to him, and John and Michael had to pretend to be delighted too, otherwise he would have treated them severely. He often went out alone, and when he came back, you were never absolutely certain whether he had had an adventure or not. He might have forgotten it so completely that he said nothing about it. And then when you went out, you found the body. And on the other hand, he might say a great deal about it, and yet you could not find the body. Sometimes he came home with his head bandaged, and then Wendy cooed over him and bathed it in lukewarm water while he told a dazzling tale. But she was never quite sure, you know. There were, however, many adventures which she knew to be true because she was in them herself, and there were still more than, still more that were at least partly true, for the other boys were in them and said that they were wholly true. To describe them all would require a book as large as an English Latin, Latin English dictionary, and the most we can do is to give one as a specimen of an average hour on the island. The difficulty is which to choose. Should we take the brush with the redskins at Slightly Gulch? It was a sanguin sanguinary affair and especially interesting as showing one of Peter's peculiarities, which was that in the middle of a fight, he would suddenly change sides. At the gulch, when victory was still in the balance, sometimes leaning this way and sometimes that, he called out, I'm a redskin today. What are you, Tootles? And Tootle an Tootles answered, Redskin, what are you, Nibs? And Nibs said, Redskin, what are you, Twin? And so on. And they were all redskin, and of course, this would have this would have ended the fight had not the real redskins, fascinated by Peter's methods, agreed to be lost boys for that once, and so it and so at it they all went again. More, more fiercely than ever. The extraordinary upshot of this adventure was, but we have not decided yet that this is the adventure we're going to narrate. Perhaps a better one would be the night attack by the Redskins on the house under the ground, when several of them stuck in the hollow trees and had to be pulled out like corks. Or we might tell how Peter saved Tiger Lily's life in the Mermaid's Lagoon, and so made her his ally. Or we could tell that Cake we could tell of that cake that the pirates cooked so that the boys might eat it and perish, and how they placed it in one cunning spot after another. But always Wendy snatched it from the hands of her children so that in time it lost its succulence and became as hard as a stone, and was used as a missile, and Hook fell over it in the dark. Or suppose we tell of the birds that were Peter's friends, particularly of the never bird that built in a tree overhanging the lagoon and how the nest fell into the water, and still the bird sat on her eggs, and Peter gave orders that she was not to be disturbed. That is a pretty story, and the end shows how grateful a bird can be. But if we tell it, we must also tell the whole adventure of the lagoon, which would of course be telling two adventures rather than just one. A shorter adventure, and quite as exciting, was Tinkerbell's attempt, with the help of some street fairies, to have the sleeping Wendy conveyed on a great lo floating leaf to the mainland. Fortunately, the leaf gave way, and Wendy woke, thinking it was bath time, and swam back. Or again, we might choose Peter's defiance of the lions, when he drew a circle around him on the ground with an arrow and dared them to cross it. And though he waited for hours, with the other boys and Wendy looking on breathlessly from the trees, not one of them would accept his challenge. Which of these adventures shall we choose? Shall we choose? The best way will be to toss for it. I have tossed and the lagoon has won. This almost makes one wish that the gulch or the cake or Tink's leaf had won. Of course, I could do it again and make it best out of three. However, perhaps it's fairest to stick to the lagoon. <laughs> and the story of the mermaid's lagoon is for next time in <laughs> chapter eight. I hope you folks had a great uh, time listening to chapter seven today. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you again soon. Bye.